on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, a Talk TV exclusive has found the Home Office are failing to deport thousands of dangerous foreign nationals like Abdul Azidi, the man wanting in connection with the chemical attack in Clapham. The shadowy plot to remove Rishi Sunak has taken a rather bitter turn with rebels creating what they're calling a grid of shit to target the Prime Minister. School's out. And travel disruption as snow falls across parts of the UK. Oh no! Two amber weather warnings remain in place tonight. We'll tell you all about it. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. It's been another massive weekend, and we are on a roll. Tonight, I'll be telling you how many millions we're wasting paying benefits to dangerous criminals. I'll be explaining why the climate nutters are targeting your football pitch, and I'll bring you the most bizarre Rishi Sunak video ever. Plus, I've got an amazing story about concrete. Yep, you heard that right. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's time to get serious. Stop laughing. Coming at you live, this is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. A Talk TV special investigation tonight can reveal that the reason acid attacker and sex offender Abdul Azidi won his appeal to stay in Britain was down to the Home Office failing to send a lawyer to his immigration tribunal to argue against it. Because it turns out this government, which makes a huge song and dance about tackling migration, actually can't be bothered to police violent foreign criminals and terrorists. Seems amazing, doesn't it? Joining me to discuss this, journalist and author Laura Donsworth, editor of Spikes Online, Tom Slater, and Talk TV's very own contributor, Esther Kraku. Very nice to see you all. Very good evening to you. I mean, I'm sort of speechless this week with the kind of <laughs> failings that we've come across in government. Not just in the way that they tracked this guy, Azidi, mm -hmm. on CCTV footage. They've now put out yet more of it today, showing him walking past the headquarters of MI6, <laughs> showing him walking in and out of Tesco's, showing him on various uh, tube trains. Nobody seems to have noticed him. You know, the fact that they didn't put out a description of him for the first night probably... Uh, is one of the reasons why they still now don't know where he is. But it also turns out that after he committed these sex assaults, he went for his tribunal hearing, which should have uh, deported him, never mind granted him asylum, and the Home Office didn't even bother to send somebody along. Mm. I mean, it's just but beggar's belief, isn't it? Well, we're supposed to be clearing a backlog <sighs> in asylum cases. Yeah, it's not a backlog, though, don't forget. And, and James so, Cleverly doesn't yeah, call it that. But, but the problem with clearing the backlog is that they're rushing and they're making mistakes mm. and they're creating a new backlog of appeals. Yes. It's a disaster. But how, in any other walk of life, could you possibly explain to me um, that when you have a, a, a tribunal which you're supposed to send a lawyer to and you don't send a lawyer to that tribunal, that that's sort of OK? Just goes ahead anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Gets way yeah. through rubber stamp. I mean, if you ever contest like, sort of a parking fine or whatever, chances are the council won't send a lawyer right. mm -hmm. when, you actually, when you actually have your hearing. I mean, I hear so, this happen. So most, so most of the time, so it doesn't surprise me that the Home Office does that. But I think the bigger issue is more structural, yeah. right? There sh you shouldn't have to send a lawyer to the sort of hearing because if you are a convicted sex offender, no asylum, mm. period. You shouldn't get asylum for converting to a religion. I'm sorry, that's a bogus excuse. If you're a single able-bodied man, you shouldn't get asylum, in right. my opinion, because you're pushing people that are actually vulnerable to the back of the queue. If you yeah. have three grand to pay a people smuggler, guess what? You're not that vulnerable. Right. There are, I kid you not, the asylum system is such a joke that some of the people coming across on boats are Indian students trying to get home fees yeah. here in the UK by coming and applying for asylum, so they're entitled to paying £9,000 a year, instead of triple that as an yeah. international student, and then they're getting refugee status. That is how ludicrous it is. Yeah. And they're coming through Serbia because Serbia has a visa-free agreement with India. Right. I mean, it is completely ludicrous. And we're not even talking about this national security risk of these people. Since 1998, one in five people convicted of terrorist offences in this country have been of an asylum background. Right. So the fact that the Home Secretary is talking about clearing the backlog yeah. when actually he's approving them, at, approving asylum seekers at almost two and a half times the rate of the EU's approval yes. rating of asylum seekers, it's, we're in a comedy of errors. You just can't make it up. Well, they're not getting any of it right at all, and you're right. I mean, I think they cleared something like 120,000, did they not, somehow over Christmas. Yeah. And we yeah. suddenly emerged from yeah, the Christmas it's, holiday, it's and they went, oh, yeah, we've, we've sorted all those. 70% approval rating for all of yeah. those people yeah. as well. So it's not only like we cleared them, we let 70% yeah. of those people to remain in mm. this country and they're not, And they're not even hiding this. I mean, they talked about how they were going to speed up the process by taking away the interview requirement right. in many cases, or at least if you came from particular countries. Yes. And the thing is, is these are not even edge cases that we're yeah. talking about here. We've got a guy who's been convicted of two sex offences, he's allowed to yes. say. 
Recently, we saw the Sudanese ISIS propagandist, who was not only allowed to stay, but was also given lifelong anonymity yeah. as a consequence of that. Then there was the Albanian crime. What do you have to do to yeah, get yeah. deported? Well, clearly, have clearly, your you, claim you, honestly, you can't do anything. You might actually have to be in a lawyer yeah. fighting citizens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry. Let's, well, let's talk about the Christianity angle of this, because I think this is, you know, understandably really riled people, because... Um, you know, it's his newfound faith yeah. didn't stop him from dousing an innocent woman and her two children with alkaline. Yeah, that's not in the it's, Bible. It's almost as though, you know, an extra commandment needs to be made yeah. up for these people. Thou shalt not be a misogynistic, sadistic bastard and douse women yes. in, in alkaline or acid. Yes. Shouldn't really need saying. So, I mean, the thing is, um, it's the Home Office that should be vetting asylum seekers, mm. not the Church of England. We can't put it all on the Church of England. Plus, the Church of England wants to welcome new people to the yes. faith and to, to baptise them. But it's obvious that there's been a huge lack of discernment in thinking that this yeah. person was genuinely interested in yeah. becoming a because Christian. Because they want them to be genuine. That's the thing. The, the, the narrative that comes from the, from the Home Office and from the Church of England is that they want to look upon all of these lovely people coming here as genuinely horribly scarred and nastily well, treated in but their they lives. Don't, they don't but they don't Christians. question them. Why? They don't why? think they're Christians. Why is that? Why well, is that I'll read you, I'll, let me read you this. This is from Justin Welby, a tweet that he put out today, right? While this dangerous bastard, as you said, is still on the run, uh, the woman is scarred for life. She'll be lucky to, to live through whatever it was he did to her. Um, it is the job of the government to protect our borders and of the courts to judge asylum cases. The church is called to love mercy and do justice. I encourage everyone to avoid irresponsible and inaccurate comments and let us not forget that at the heart of this conversation are vulnerable people whose lives are precious in wow. the sight of God. Do you know what's irresponsible, though? Right? What's irresponsible is the clergy not mm. having discernment exactly. to know whether somebody I, really, you know mean, what? really I means it or not. To... Because they know what they're doing. Yeah. They know what they're doing. It's not an automatic stamp of approval, but they know exactly what mm. they're doing. And I don't think they always think these people are Christians because they they seem to become a kind of liberal arm of, of Dav Davos yeah. or something. So I went onto the Church of England website after this report has been shared right. that they, um, they, they have a report about support for asylum seekers. I went onto their website. They have thousands of articles and reports yeah. about asylum. And I thought, oh, I wonder if they've got the same for the homeless or drug addicts. Do you no. know what they don't? Nowhere near the same not. volume. So why are they not putting all the same energy and efforts into the kind of homegrown problems we've got mm. with people who are really struggling in this country rather than just trying to fast track asylum seeking claims for men who don't deserve to well, be Well, it's here. a short walk from Lambeth Palace. In fact, uh, the asylum seeker who's wanted for the, uh, the throwing of the acid with half uh, in fact walked past on. Lambeth Palace yeah. on his way uh, to Vauxhall Bridge. Mm. Um, but they could walk a short uh, distance from there and find loads of homeless people in Waterloo Station and take them all back to Lambeth Palace and give them a good meal. Also, even if you, if you care about genuine refugees, mm. supporting this free-for-all is a non-starter. First of all, because public support for the, the asylum system is going to fall even further than it already right. has. Mm. Second of all, the victim in this case, we don't know a lot about her, but the details that we have is that she may have been staying in a refugee hotel. Yeah. She may well have been an asylum seeker or a yeah. refugee herself. They were in a relationship, we know that. But at the same time, you would hope that obviously he was living in another part of the country. Yeah. He could have easily been apprehended, jailed. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he didn't end up actually serving a prison sentence for sexual assault and exposure, the fact that he got the, the equivalent of a few weeks suspended yeah. for something that should raise eyebrows... Right. Which itself. apparently is the reason why they can't deport him, because mm -hmm. you only get deported if you serve a minimum of a year in prison. Mm -hmm. And not I suspended. Mean, that's, it's, the it's, thing is, who, who, who is making up these rules? It's that the Home Office. It is this cabal of, of human rights lawyers and supranational courts and all of these people that really don't have an interest in Britain's national security because they don't live close to the problem. Right. Whenever they make these bad decisions, they're not the ones that have to bear the brunt of it. They're not the ones who have acid or alkaline doused in their faces. Mm. They never have to deal with it. There should be no stipulation for you converting to Christianity is a reason, is, is a good excuse, no. or a valid reason for you to be remain in this country. If you're a single man, I don't think you should be given asylum. I mean, asylum claims should be so difficult to actually be approved in this country. The EU's average for approving asylum seekers is 37%. Yeah. Ours should be about and 10 And that's high for a lot of countries. Exactly. France is even lower than that. It should be about 10%. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm. There, and there should be a cap on it. Yeah. it, it it is, and we should be prioritizing women and children. I know people who've come to this country as asylum seekers who are, not, who are refugees, who you know went to the public education system, are now dentists and productive members of society. Right. And guess what? They were not single men from Afghanistan with the ability to douse alkaline in people's faces. Yeah, this is the problem. 
and it is a European-wide problem, but we seem to be the kind of the, the kicking um, boy for everybody else's problems because they know most of these asylum seekers, if they come to Britain, they'll never leave. They won't have to leave. They'll be given a house, they'll be given money, they'll be given the ability to, to get a job if they need one, uh, but they can if they want disappear into the black market. You know, there's been stories about bogus law firms who help people. Mm. There's been stories about charities who give advice to people as to what you can say to make sure that you stay here. You know, the whole thing's a racket. And it, nobody seems to realise that. It's an industry. Yeah. It's become an industry. It's the worst sort of industry, mm. isn't it? But I think I think that's another thing. Like, not, not only is there a failure here of the Home Office, and not only is this about immigration, but it seems to me there are lots of stories, contemporary stories, that are connected. And we're not supposed to talk about them being connected. No. But we, but we know... But they are. But we know they yeah. are, because it's this whole kind of multiculturalism is failing yeah. story. You know, at, around this time that we've got um, Abdul Azedi attacking an innocent woman and children. We also had Mike Freer, MP yeah. Mike Freer, who had to step down from um, his seat in Finchley and Golders yeah. Green because of all the threats. threats of yeah. violence, Islamist mm. extremists. And, you know, every Saturday, every Saturday, we seem to be tolerating calls for intifada yeah. and the annihilation of the State of Israel. And now add to that people cheering for the sex trafficking pirate Houthis who attack British ships. Yeah. And it's, he just sentenced a load of gay people to death, incidentally. They yeah. did. They Quite just recently. sentenced 12 another, gay another, people to death as well. Another Such a tolerant thing that, regime. Another thing that connects a lot of these cases as well is the fact that the politicians cannot talk about it. They deflect. Mm. Mike Freer happens. There's suddenly a conversation in Parliament about how MPs should be nice to yeah. each other. Mm. Well, that the was Islamist the Speaker of the House, Lindsay Hoyle. Exactly. Well, exactly nothing. the same thing. Exactly. And then what happened after the Abdullah Zaidi thing came to light? You had a Tory MP and Labour MP on the BBC saying the big problem facing women are microaggressions. microaggressions. Yeah. These well, are not serious Look, people, Look at the outrage this week. This week, our media complex has been so outraged by Rishi Sunak making the same comment he's been making over the last year and a half to, to um, Keir Starmer, who cannot respond to the question of what is a woman, right? right. He's never been this outraged, but just because they, they, they decided to bolt themselves onto this tragedy that Brianna Jai's mother went through, now it's, it's a complete outrage for him yeah. to say, actually... The, the leader of the opposition who could potentially be our next prime minister not being able to define what a woman is is a problem. I mean, this is the thing. They're not outraged by Abdul no. Aziz. We're not seeing this sort of media campaign. We're not seeing Jess Phillips tweet her mind, like her, her mind off about all of this. Oh, but yeah. they're outraged about comments. Oh, yeah, no, Jess Phillips made, was absolutely to, appalled. To, to, <coughs> by, yeah, no, she was appalled by what Rishi Sunak through. said, not appalled by, by what Abdul Abedi Aziz. did. No. Amazing, you know. And it's all about misogyny. It's not about immigration. It's not well, about, it's about asylum. asylum. No, but it is about... What the hell are they talking it's, about? It's about misogyny, but there's a cultural aspect to yeah. it that we're not, we're not supposed join to talk the dots, about. We're guys. not supposed to join the dots, but there is a cultural aspect. Yeah. And it does nobody any service to be, you know, not to be honest about it. The fact is that the um, rights of a really vile, cretinous, misogynistic, dangerous, horrible man yeah. were put above the rights yeah. of the women of this country. Now, we have a social contract with our, with our government. You know, I pay taxes for mm. services, and one of the very basic services I would like is secure borders, yeah. and the other one is safe streets. Safe I don't street. really want a great deal from the government, no. but those are two of the things I want much, as part of my contract. You wouldn't think so. What about the other story this week, which is about the refugee from Afghanistan mm. who can't actually be named... Uh, because we think he might be a spy, but we're not sure. But if he was a spy, never mind, he was given asylum seeker status anyway, and he ended up working inside of MI6, despite the fact um, that the government are now claiming that he was actually working for the Russians. It's incredible, this, because he huh? came here in 2000. Yeah. And he claimed asylum as coming from Afghanistan. Right. It later transpired that he, he spent wasn't that the six before, years in between wasn't that before in we Russia. Went to, yeah, but what, wasn't that before we went to Absolutely. Afghanistan? He was, he was fleeing the it Taliban. It was before 9-11. It yeah. was before anybody started chasing around after the Taliban. It was, it was, I think, when Afghanistan was occupied by Russia. But this is... We're talking about how our institutions are wrecked and they have no common sense. I imagine... Not an expert, but I imagine that many intelligence agencies around the world... Because obviously he's accused of being a Russian spy constantly send people over to other countries to try and infiltrate their spy yeah. networks. They know the deal, they know how to infiltrate yeah. the web. And yet the fact that he was just welcomed with open arms into GCHQ, yeah. then MI6, he met Prince Charles, right. and then suddenly <laughs> they turned around and realised that this guy might not be on the up He might up. not it's have been telling the state. truth. I mean, incredible, isn't it? When you come in and they go, are you a Russian spy? No, fine. It's a bit like when you fill out the, the visa form to go to America, you know. Yeah, are you a terrorist? Uh, are you intending to commit any terrorist acts? Ah, uh, no, absolutely not. No <laughs> chance at all. OK, but you're from Saudi Arabia. Yep, yeah, we are. And uh, you can learn, learn to fly planes but not land them. Yep, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> it, I mean, and, you know, then suddenly 9-11 happens and they go, oh, my God, what the hell were we thinking? 
I mean, is this an, an outrageous suggestion? Uh, it could be, uh, it could be, but should you not have to not only be British, but have been born here to be at MI6? No, I don't see. No, I don't think you get that. See, because you need spies to be from foreign places. Don't you? you can't just send, you know, Billy Blue Nuts into you know Afghanistan. One of the reasons, apparently, the Americans were so useless at doing pretty good uh, spyware in Pakistan was they couldn't find any Americans who could handle the food. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. That is pathetic. Because people would go to Pakistan from America, they would dress up as as sort of Bedouins or whatever, um, but they would always get the shits. And so, in the (laughs) end, they would have to come back home. (laughs) They couldn't stay there. I'm sorry, it's just the way it was. The key of being a And the CIA admitted that they needed to get around it somehow by hiring locals who they couldn't trust. Well, but this is the difficulty, (laughs) because if you're a spy, you want to be inconspicuous. Right, but if you if you can't speak the language to to like you know a convincing yeah. degree, if you don't have a good accent, if right. you stand out in any way, you can't be a good spy. So in a way, you have to have a bit of a local. But if you have a local, then where are they? Where do but they need a handler? Lie? Exactly. Then you need a handler. It's it's really. And this is how they lost nightmare. track of the whole Osama bin Laden, um, you know, plot to blow up America, because they they didn't have enough intelligence. Well, their spies had a touch of the deli belly and couldn't attend yeah. to their duties. Yeah, I mean, That's you know, it's literally that, it's that <laughs> simple, and it is ridiculous. But to your point. Maybe they should also think about the numbers of people coming here from these countries who could, if, for example, something terrible was to happen and we were to end up going into some kind of Middle Eastern conflict, you know, what would happen then? Who would all these people who now currently march down the streets calling for jihad and calling for a free Palestine, whose side do you think they'd be on? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. It's pretty obvious whose side they're on. When they were talking about conscription recently, I was thinking, well, I can't see that going very well. People are going to want to be in completely different units mm. fighting on different sides. Yeah. Well, I said this um, when I did a, a, a monologue months ago when October 7th happened, and we talked about the numbers of people on the streets, and I said, you know, I've been living in this country longer time than probably all of you. I don't remember, um, you know, the six-day war, people being marched on the streets. I don't remember the war in the Golan Heights, people being marched onto the streets. I don't remember when there was the big intifada, um, you know, back at the beginning of 2000. They weren't marching on the streets. You know why? Because they weren't here. But now they are, and now they're marching, and now they've managed to infest our stupid young people with the idea that Israel is a sort of fascist uh, terrorist state. Well, th- I think I we, find we, it we're dealing with the TikTok generation. I, I, yeah. I actually think we should ban TikTok, for starters. Yeah. Because I, I really don't see any benefit of having that satanic app in, in, in the West in general when it's banned in, the ch- in China. The I've country never heard that's anyone call it satanic it, before, it's, but it's I'm not satanic app. It's satanic it's, app. It's awful. It's just... I mean, I, I, I don't like social media on the best of days, even though I do find some entertainment from memes. But TikTok is just poison. Mm. And the TikTok, poison. the TikTok part of it, I think, is important because a lot of the people that you see on the streets, these aren't the kind of older Muslim gentlemen in the community or whatever. Right. This is kind of Muslim identity politics, which yeah. has been propagated towards the youth in particular. Right. And even these kids, second, third, fourth generation, yeah, yeah. they've got no connection to no. this issue at all. And many of them have no idea. It's become a kind of identity. I think it's become a kind of um, identity politics sort of rebellion yeah. thing. That's a kind generous assessment. I, I, I would even go to the base. These people are not capable of critical thinking or understanding nuance. I think that's that's actually the I saw a little it. video, actually, which I think was posted on TikTok, funnily enough, and it was at the Sundance Film Festival, and it was somebody filming these people demonstrating on behalf of Palestine. Mm-hmm. And when asked the question, you know, which sea is it that you think the River to the Sea refers to, we had the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Red Sea. Not one of them said the Mediterranean. You know, they don't know what they're doing. Classic. No, I think, look, you can blame TikTok for some of the younger generation useful idiots. You mm. can't blame TikTok for everything. TikTok wasn't around when Hamas wrote its charter calling for all Jews in the world Very to be true. killed and the um, state but of Israel to be annihilated. Know about it, right? But yeah, I mean, the TikTok generation probably isn't helping. But, you know, there's, there's different factions at those Saturday mm. marches, and unfortunately, we can't pin it all on TikTok. No, that's true, but we can blame some of it on them. <laughs> Um, we've got many more people to blame, and I've got the most ridiculous video to show you later on of Rishi Sunak. If you haven't seen it today, it is really quite something. But thank you guys for the moment. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, and you better stay watching as well, because I've got some juicy goss from Westminster. There's another wild card political comeback looming, and a Tory plot is brewing. If your name starts with Rishi and ends with Sunak, you won't want to miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. 
a woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet. Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Where are we going on this show? <laughs> it's carry on, what just happened? <laughs> Whoa! It's... Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money, they're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple, the downturn in the spend is three simple words financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that stuff is actually making him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Let's bring you some breaking news now. And US President Joe Biden will not face criminal charges over the handling of classified documents after the president portrayed himself as an elderly man with a poor memory, said the special counsel. Biden's actions were labelled present serious risks to national security after he concluded the president had willfully retained and disclosed classified materials. Mr Biden welcomed the decision, adding that he cooperated completely and agreed to five hours of in-person interviews even over the two days following Hamas's attack on Israel on the 7th of October. Although, tragically, I dare say, he probably doesn't remember the interrogation because he's an old man with not a very good memory. What a great way to get out of something that you don't want to get uh, charged with. And by the way, do you think he's going to use that in his campaign materials when he goes uh, up against Donald Trump a bit later on this year? We shall see. Uh, back to more mundane matters, or possibly not, the shadowy plot to remove Rishi Sunak has taken a bit of a bitter turn, with rebels creating a so-called grid of shit to target the Prime Minister, employing a group of former government aides to whip up a storm of announcements to put a dent in Rishi's plans. I'm joined now by former Conservative advisor Leon Amirali and a political editor of The Express Online, David Maddox. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. And I'll start with you, David. I mean, um, Rishi Sunak's doing a pretty good job of kiboshing his own career anyway, isn't he? Why would they bother? Yeah, I, I mean, when I saw the, uh, the grid of the uh, sticky brown stuff, I, <laughs> I have to be honest, I... Uh... Uh, I thought, what, why, why have they gone to all the effort? I mean, it, <laughs> it seems to be literally week in, week out. There seems to be one disaster after another, right. or you know, I mean, whether it's PMQs and you know, uh, upsetting people in the uh, gallery, or uh, you know, some dodgy social media. It's it 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 seems bizarre to me. But I mean, it it kind of plays into the fact that there is. There are plots, I should say. It's not just one plot. I mean, there's, there's of course, the Dougie Smith, uh, Michael Gove, allegedly, although, of course, he's an on, uh, uh, a uh, loyal member of the Cabinet, uh, that sort of plot to get Kemi in. But there are other plots going on as well. 
with various uh, leadership hopefuls, you know, we're at Suella Braverman or even Robert Jenrick, perhaps, or mm. Liz Truss wanting to make a comeback, God help us, you know, uh, it never stops. And no. uh, at some point, somebody's going to pull the trigger, I think. Well, I guess so, but it's a question of who's holding the gun, really, isn't it? Because Kerry Badnock keeps getting mentioned as well, particularly by Nadine Dorries and Liam, uh, Leon, rather. I don't know what a grid of shit actually is. I mean, <laughs> have you ever come across this particular phraseology in your time behind the uh, at the door of number 10? It's a new one to me, Mike. Right. Uh, it's a new one to me. But, I mean, presumably, as David says, Rishi's doing the job for them. Yeah. Right? So, you but would I, think. I, I think this is part of the big problem that Rishi Sunak's got, is that there are factions on every single wing of the party yes. who are sort of converging to try and take him out. And I think the, that's purely for self-preservation uh, because right. they can see that Rishi Tunak is going to lead them to an electoral defeat. But the trouble is none of them can agree on what the actual way of doing it is. They're all trying to get rid of Rishi Sunak, but none of them are actually seeing it from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, and this is always the problem when there is some sort of coup against the leader. Mm. Who is the person who's going to take over? And if you haven't got a clear and obvious choice. It's very difficult. I'll take you back to when Theresa May was deposed and it was obvious mm. Boris Johnson was going to be the guy who comes yes. in. It isn't obvious now who is going to be that man or woman who takes right. over from Richie Sunak. Kemi's name's being mentioned. She's not universally popular in the party by right. any stretch. So I think until there is a single candidate they can unify around, right. Rishi may well find himself just being covered in shit but not necessarily being taken down by <laughs> Quite right, too. Well, this is the thing, David. I mean, we already had um, Simon Clark sort of stepping out in front of everybody else just last week, you know, the week before, and suggesting that uh, Rishi Sunak had to step aside because he was ruining the party. But he did that literally about a day after I'd seen Liz Truss, um, who was very happy to tell me that he was one of their sort of four horsemen of the apocalypse. He was going to launch <laughs> PodCon. Um, and he was immediately then shunted out of that group because they didn't actually want to back getting rid of Rishi yet. Yes, I mean, it's all very confused, frankly. I mean, I, I have to say the mood... This last week, and you have to take it week by week with the Tory MPs at the moment, but the mood this last week is that there doesn't seem to be a kind of desire to jump straight into a leadership contest. A lot of them just seem depressed and exhausted, mm. perhaps because they're going on holiday next week. You know, we've got a, a <laughs> recess next week. Yes, so half maybe term. They'll, come, they'll come back a little bit more energised. I think the I think the issue is going to be the uh, the by elections. Myself, if mm. they end up coming third in two by elections, which were safe seats, then surely that's going to be the point where they say this guy's got to go. If yeah. not, frankly, it'll be too late, and they've, they've got to go into the election with him. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the other opportunity, um, Leon, would be the the the, the, the local elections. I yeah. think in May which I've been told previously, if they go really horribly wrong for the Tories, mm. he'll have to go. Yeah, I mean, there's no way that he can continue if he gets trounced in by-elections, yeah. trounced in local elections. Right. Well, the general elections next, guess what's going to happen? So, yeah, I think that is going to be a really important point when the aftermath of the May elections. Yeah. But it might be too late by then, Mike, because yeah. you, you let's say that you, you get a new leader in place immediately after May. They're probably not going to take the keys until about June. And then how long have you got for them to set out their stall to the country, whoever it is, for an election in October, November time? So yeah. I think the timing is, is going to be very difficult for the Tories to actually get rid of Sunak. I yeah. think David's right. I think the by-elections might be the moment that gives them mm. just enough time to make it happen. I think yeah. May might be a bit too late. Yeah. Should we look at what uh, Sir Keir Starmer's been up to, David, as well? Because I read a tweet <laughs> today from one of your colleagues, I think it was Harry Cole, who said... You know, there is uh, a school of thought that says, you know, when your opponent is making such a hash of everything, uh, you don't really need to say anything. Starmer decided to kibosh his own £28 billion <laughs> pound green eco-save-the-planet plan um, when I don't think he really needed to, did he? No, I mean, it's just uh, amazing, really. <laughs> it seems like all the main parties have been going through some form of personal grief in the last 24 <laughs> hours. I mean, Ed Miliband, uh, we, uh, we worked out, has, has been missing in action for more than 100 days as yes. well. That's his environment chap. I mean, it's not uh, it's not good. And this, of course, is the great, the one last great hope, the straw to clutch on for the Conservatives is that Keir Starmer literally now doesn't stand for anything. He's just ditched his one major policy. He also ditched a minor policy, which was to abolish the House of Lords mainly because, quotes they're doing a good job, i.e. stopping things like the Rwanda bill or stopping uh, 
you know, some of the conservative reforms. So why get rid of your allies? I yes. guess. But you know, it's it, this is a this is a problem with British politics at the moment. It's not a great choice, uh, and frankly, uh, with very little to offer and not a great deal of charisma, it is possible if Rishi survives a coup or non-coup that he could actually pull it back against Starmer. And yeah. th th that's their one hope. Well, I mean, the one hope, I suppose, as well, is that they don't necessarily lose by quite such a big margin as they thought, which, which you and I have said before is probably more than likely to be the case. But one thing that uh, Ed Miliband seems to have got rid of, I'm not sure if anybody could find it, uh, was retweeted a few times this morning, was his tweet uh, from the 9th of June 2023. Some people don't want Britain to borrow to invest in the green economy. They want us to back down. But Keir, Rachel and I will never let that happen. Britain needs this £28 billion a year plan, and that is what we are committed to. <laughs> there well, you, go. you can just rip that one up, Ed. Have yeah. another bacon sandwich, mate. Well, that's Keir Starmer not only lying to the to the public, but lying to his own shadow cabinet. Yeah. It's unbelievable. But... And, of course, some people said today, well, shouldn't Ed Miliband now resign? Because I... he said that, you know, he would never let this happen. There's good grounds for him to resign. I mean, yeah. that, that's his whole sort of reason for being, Ed Miliband, yeah. is, is, is the green agenda. So I think that Labour are really in the muddle because exactly as David says, yeah. what are we voting for if we vote for Labour mm. other than just not the Tories? And right. that's not going to be good enough. I think the polls will inevitably narrow. Yeah. And I think that it's going to be a slightly difficult election for Keir, for Keir Starmer, yeah. more difficult than it seems right now. Yes. And if... There's a very small majority for Labour, let's say 10 seats, 15 seats. Mm. I think there's going to be another election quickly hot on the hills after that because right. there'll be a lot of discontent in the Labour Party, yes. just as there is in the Conservative Party right now as well. Yeah, I think so. And David, I mean, that's the other problem for Labour. I think they've put themselves into a bit of a bind because one of the reasons they said for giving up on this £28 billion plan uh, was that they would be very happy to U-turn any time they thought they couldn't afford to do something. Can you imagine how much that's going to get played back to them? Every time they, pay, they make any suggestion of spending money, they'll get told, well, you just have to U-turn now because you did it last time when you couldn't find the money. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, um, they've U-turned so often on so many things now. We lost count. My colleague, um, Christian Calgi, actually was putting together a, an article on Labour's U-turns in the last few years, and he got to 15. I told him to stop there because, you know, it was, it was just getting exhausting. <laughs> I think technically they've disappeared uh, up their own sphincter, haven't they, at this point? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, maybe... The, <laughs> I mean, the issue is, well, it's a very serious one, that Labour literally stands for very little now, apart from the fact that they're not the Tories. Now, there is one precedent they'll be holding on to, which is a, one which I doubt many of your viewers will have really uh, clocked. It's the 2007, I think it was, Australian election, where Kevin Rudd became the Labour Prime Minister. Yes. And, and they're literally advising him on this. Uh, there are people around him advising him on this. So, and, and the strategy was to say nothing and let the Liberal Party, which, of course, is their version of the Tories, implode. And that duly happened. Kevin Rudd won and became Prime Minister. And then everybody was shocked when he actually started doing some left-wing things. And that seems to be the only thing now that the uh, Labour Party have got left in the locker. Yeah. It's an amazing situation that, that they can have such useless choices. I think this is the worst election prospect I think I've ever seen. Mm, I think that's why we're seeing reform doing yeah. so well in the polls. Mm. And, you know, that wasn't the case before. And you've effectively got the rights of the vote being split now by, by obviously, reform mm. and the Conservatives. And I don't blame the public for looking for alternatives because they can't get what they want from the, from the current Conservative government. They can't get what they want from the Labour government. So where else do they look? And I think there's just a great amount of apathy yeah. right now in British politics. The yeah. public aren't interested, the public aren't engaged, because as far as they're concerned, it's all the same. Nothing is, nothing is going to change. Their lives aren't going to be any better, regardless of who's in Downing Street. And what a horrible situation yeah. to be in. We should have politicians with a vision for the country that differ, yeah. have two sets of proposals, and we decide what's the right course of action. Currently, uh, Keir Starmer's saying nothing. Rishi Sunak's not entirely sure exactly what he's doing no. or what he's saying. And what are we, the voting public, meant to, meant to do with that? I mean, today he even sort of mentioned the B word, didn't he? Boris Johnson said, oh, I still speak to Boris and, you know, I feel that we did some very many great things together. Nadine Dorries immediately came out and said, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't talk to Boris at all. <laughs> I mean, can Boris ever come back? Well, 
I, I think Boris is clearly incredibly popular still with the country yeah. as well as the Conservative Party. I think that it was a mistake in retrospect to get rid of him entirely because yeah. Partygate was, yes, a blot on his copybook, but it wasn't necessarily right. the end of the world. But was it really Partygate? I mean, it was more all the other stuff, wasn't it? Well, I think it was. I think it was It was effectively people wanted mm. their crack at the, at the whip and, yeah. and, and that's what they wanted. But if Boris comes out and says, I fully support Rishi Sunak and this government, that will be a boost He's to him, not going to do Rishi that, Sunak. I mean, I don't know. It depends what Rishi Sunak can offer him, right, in, yeah. in, in return. If he can offer him something that's appealing, then maybe there might be some sort of deal to have between the two. But let's let's remember, it was Rishi Sunak, ultimately, he who came him. to his... Yeah. Exactly. He, he was the one who got rid of Boris. Yeah. So um, I think what he does next will be a big uh, a big step in, in some sort of direction for Sunak. David, you see that as scenario playing out? No, I don't at all. I mean, I, I, I know that the Conservative membership want to bring back Boris desperately. And, and of course, uh, right in wanting that. And of course, he can't because he's no longer an MP. Uh, we, we ran a survey that a Conservative Post had done with 2,000 Conservative members, which showed by far and away that Boris was the number one choice. And of course, it was a historic mistake to get rid of him. I mean, there's only two people with the charisma to save the Conservative Party, and that's Boris and Nigel Farage. And let's be honest, whilst the members may want both of them or either of them, the, and most of the MPs don't want them, and that's the and that's the problem with yeah. the party at the moment. I mean, it, it's it's a complete mess. I don't see Boris uh, endorsing Rishi at all because he's still very hurt about what happened. I could see him coming back. I could see him endorsing the next leader and being the kingmaker or queenmaker mm. for the next leader, and then coming back on the back of that and maybe leading the party again at some point. I mean, whenever you see him in a room, they're all still rushing to be next to him and have their pictures taken with him. And I'm talking about MPs, not just members of the public. You know, there's still a big draw there. Maybe they could just give him a peerage, stick him in the House of Lords like David Cameron. That would be the logic, wouldn't it, is mm. that you, you bring him back into the fold in some way or another. But I think there is a, a lot of animosity between the two camps, yeah. even if not between oh, Rishi sure. and Boris personally. Yeah. I think there is anyway. But between mm. the two camps, there really is a level of animosity. So to get them working together again, I'm not sure is necessarily going to be an easy thing to do. But Boris Johnson is the one superstar of the Conservative yeah. Party. He really is. And you see it at party conferences, yeah. as you say, you see it when he walks into a room. Right. Everyone with a Conservative leaning uh, seems to adore him. Yeah. And he invokes this sense of either love or hate. Yeah. And sometimes that's enough to win elections mm. if you've got enough uh, more people that love or hate. Yeah. Sunak's problem is people don't feel anything about no. him at all. And that's a real problem because he can't whip up some sort of base to mm. take him over the line in an election. No. Boris could do that. Nigel Farage could do that. There's not many others in the Conservative Party no. or in the Conservative movement who could. No, I think that's right. Leon O'Reilly, thank you very much indeed. David Maddox, thank you to you as well. Uh, we'll have more on the Rishi Sunak phenomenon, uh, as uh, it might be called or might not be called, later on uh, in the show. You're watching the Supreme Independent Republican Mike Graham. Hold on to your seats because you're going to find out why Keith Starmer's being trolled by his own flock. And I've got some more on the smirking grifters from Montecito. I'll be right back. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the streets or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow's like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, 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 there we go on this show. <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, uh, <man. laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. 
Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. And we've got even more breaking news to bring you tonight. Queen Camilla has spoken publicly for the first time since her husband, King Charles, cancer diagnosis. The Queen said King Charles is doing extremely well under the circumstances as she arrived alone at a special ceremony this evening. The 76-year-old appeared in good spirits at Salisbury Cathedral and she continued to put on a brave face amid that treatment that her husband is undergoing. And just as if we were talking about the royal family, who better now to join me live from Los Angeles is the founder of the To Die For Daily podcast, Ms Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, welcome back to the Independent Republic, Mike Graham. We've had a busy old week, so um, I'm delighted that, that, that we can sort of end it here um, with a little catch-up, I suppose. Uh, Queen Camilla out on her own tonight down at Salisbury Cathedral saying that uh, the King is doing as well as can be expected effectively under the circumstances. Um, he's obviously having the night off, I suppose. Um, Harry's back. Megan's smiling. Um, what's it all about? Wait, another thing that Camilla said that I thought was so important was he is very touched by all the letters and messages that the public have been sending mm. from all over the world. She said everywhere, but I'm assuming it's from all over the world because I know of several Americans that have sent well wishes to yeah. the king and queen after this, you know, horrific news. Yeah. Um, so I love hearing that people are so touched by this and are so concerned about his health that they take a moment to stop and, and reach out to them directly. I think that that says a lot about this king's rain. Yeah, absolutely. And how's it being portrayed uh, over in the States now that they know that Harry came over and went back and you were saying uh, just the other night, I think, that, you know, it's not really, well, it wasn't really being portrayed as a successful visit uh, for Harry, particularly, because he didn't see William, he didn't stay in a royal uh, residence and he ended up in a hotel for 26 hours of the trip. Well, I'll tell you that the tone is really uh, one of desperation. It looks like Harry is eager to get back within the royal fold. Is it because he's concerned about his father's health? Is it because professionally uh, the Sussex brand has taken a dive and it's directly related mm. to the way that he's treated his family? We don't know. Um, but it, there is a sense of Harry is desperate to get back in with the royal family. Harry wants a truce. Uh, that's the tone we're seeing here. Here in the states yeah a couple of weird things to, to, to mention and I, I don't imagine uh, you would uh, disagree with me when I say I don't know why people would get upset by this but apparently when Prince William uh, when Prince William uh, sort of thanked the Filipino nurses as he called them uh, for the way that they looked after his uh, his wife uh, Catherine Princess of Wales um, people went oh we shouldn't have said that I mean what's the big deal I know. 
I know. Uh, that's right. Prince William, he honored a woman named Patricia Spruce with an MBE with an MBE on Wednesday at Windsor. And Spruce wrote on her LinkedIn profile that Prince William said that Catherine had two Filipino nurses looking after her and they were amazing mm. and kind. And so one person lashed out at him on social media saying it's I mean, it, it's it's hearsay. It's not even he didn't even directly th say this, right. but it's very telling who is included in the in Archie's complexion debacle. Another post person posted um what does their race have to do with anything and i'm with you i'm i just i'm taking it back having people from different cultures and backgrounds around you yeah. can be a wonderful and eye-opening experience he could have mentioned it because they have brought a new energy and knowledge yeah. and joy into his house and his family really appreciates it right well this is the thing with the wokest though you know they want you to be multicultural but you can't mention that anybody's from a different place otherwise somehow that's against the rules of multiculturalism you know it's great that we have so much multiculturalism people from so many different countries but don't you dare actually point out that that's where they're from because somehow that would be rude same as all these bozos who have been coming jumping on social media from the left complaining about um, how the royal family don't do anything you know let's go back to cutting ribbons you know who's going to care if they can't work you know absolutely kind of poisonous toxic nasty horrible individuals yeah, I mean, specifically when they're talking about the health of King Charles or trying to downplay this diagnosis. Mm. King Charles, I've n I have not one example of him that's been proven. He doesn't discriminate. He has spent a, a significant amount of his life trying to improve people's lives in parts of the country with social and economical problems. Mm. I mean, I... This is a kumbaya king, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but he is a peaceful man. Yeah. And the nasty negativity, I think, reflects more on the pundits than general public perception of his majesty. And, you know, the queen, Camilla, acknowledging the amount of, of mail and well wishes they've, they've received, I think that, that, that that's proof of that. Um, but I think the world, for the most part, is rooting for him and rooting for the royal family. Absolutely. So what next for the uh, the happy couple from Montecito Manor? Um, you mentioned this week that they've got the Invictus Games up in Canada to get organised with, and I don't know whether that's something that they're working on uh, this weekend, but Megan was spotted smoking. Is that uh, a, a new habit she's picked she up? Smirking, sorry. I, I didn't see her smoking. I saw her with a coffee mug, which I thought was maybe a subtle trying to subtly remind us that she's an investor in a coffee company, oh, but yes. I did not see her. Oh, right, I did okay. not see her smoking. Well, maybe that was misreported. <laughs> maybe that was misreported. But tell us, when, when are they off to Canada? They're off to Canada. We believe they're off to Canada next week to promote the 2025 Invictus Games. So it'll be a lot of photo taking and a lot of smiles. Perhaps that was Prince Harry's sense of urgency. And I mean, I know a lot of people are complaining and, and criticizing the 30 minute mark, but perhaps this was the first and only time he could get out there and he wanted to do it sooner than later. And I think we should be a little bit kinder when it comes to him showing up to see his father for all we know, he has regrets and he wants to express those. Mm. Perhaps he just misses his dad. And that is what, you know, royal watchers have been curious. They're just, they couldn't believe that he hadn't done those things mm. so far. So let's, let's assume the best in this case. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Kinsey, great to see you again. Thank you very much indeed. Kinsey Schofield there reporting into us uh, from Hollywood, uh, the home of Tinseltown, of course. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, I'll give you the lowdown on the snowmageddon that's got children across the country excited about the possibility they might miss another day of school. Plus, Somerset Council's hell-bent on creating eyesores. Stay tuned. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it.
this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet. Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows. Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on. A horse crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa! Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Steve Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that stuff is actually making him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for taking the mic. They say time waits for no man. Well, in Western Superman, not only does it not wait, it changes completely. And I don't mean it's moved to a new time zone either. No, I'm afraid I've got some bad news because the famous Western Supermare town clock has suddenly been wiped off the face of the town. And it's one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. Have a look at the beautiful floral clock here. If you've ever been to Western Supermare, you'll know it's not one of the very many charming aspects of the place because there's not a lot of charm there. It was created in 1935 and has been pleasing residents and visitors alike for decades. It was even restored to its full glory once in 1951. The problem is, it was apparently very hard to maintain. And even though it is on land owned by Somerset Council, it's been looked after by a charity group called the Western Lions. And you'll never guess what they've done. Wait for it. They've concreted over the clock. I'll say that again. The volunteers looking after the famous clock have poured concrete over it and covered it up. Have a look at this. Amazing. Uh, for those of you who are fans of the Independent Republic, you will know how close to my heart this story is. And it gets better. The Lions have been maintaining the clock for the past 10 years and they say they just can't do it anymore. Chick Parkin, president, of the Western Lions said they were having to plant 20,000 plants and water them every single year. He said they asked for more people to help out, but only two volunteers came forward. And over the last three years, he says, we found it harder and harder to look after the clock. He says watering the flowers three times a week in the summer just wasn't enough to keep them alive. The council, however, are not quite so understanding. Apparently it came as a bit of a shock. They say they were not given any notice of the work and they did not give permission for it to happen. Mike Solomon from North Somerset Council says they're going to have to have a meeting with the Lions. It's been important to Westonians, and I am a Westonian, he said. We are in a place now where we just don't think we've got that kind of money to spend, and it's difficult to think of a way forward. So, the plan now is for a local artist to paint a mural of sunflowers on the concrete, and there will be some permanent flowers to attract bees. But the good news is they won't have to use quite as much water as before because everyone knows you don't have to water concrete 
to make it grow. Now, if you've been out and about today, you will know that very large parts of the UK uh, were blanketed by snow and there was an awful lot of rain going on as well. But the Met Office have got amber warnings all over the place. Schools were shut, gritters galore were out there. Uh, in some places, it was a winter wonderland. Uh, and we sent our Talk TV correspondent, Nick Ellaby, out to a place in Denbyshire in Wales called Llangochlen today. Here's what he had to say. We love the snow, don't we? And we all go a little bit mad when it falls. I'm here at Llangollen Railway in North Wales. I'm just southwest of Wrexham, and we've been out in it all morning. We've had a lot of snow here, even on the lower lying areas, since about nine o'clock this morning. We've been up in the hills earlier. We even met a skier who's trying to ski different parts of Wales that he's not skied before. But here in Llangollen, settling quite a lot, certainly starting to settle on the roads as well. There are quite a few cars around, but taking it easy. But here in North Wales, Mike, there's been quite a lot of disquiet today because just to the north of here in the county of Flintshire because of that amber warning for snow that the Met Office issued in advance the entire county of Flintshire closed all of its schools for today but they've currently haven't really seen any snow at all it's raining more up there so there are a lot of unhappy parents on social media complaining they've had to find alternative plans a number of schools as well have been closed today in Gwynedd and Powys and then across into northern England, that other amber warning today was across the southern Pennines and the Peak District. And there were some 35 gritters out in the Peak District today trying to keep those roads clear. And the train operators are also telling us that the, the disruption to travel that we've seen today could well run into Friday as well because of high winds. Even on the south coast where there's been a lot of rain today, those high winds still running into Friday and, and possibly causing disruption even up until the weekend but here in north wales absolutely stunning do you know what i might do mike join those uh, kids that are having an off day and um go and have a bit of fun with them cheers mike well done nick that was uh, talk tv's correspondent nick ellaby the intrepid uh, nick ellaby out there of course in the snow uh, we'll see the wall of snow that was expected doesn't exactly seem to have become a wall of snow but you're watching the independent republic of mike graham after the break wild west britain the shopping trend sweeping the country how raids robberies and thefts have our businesses on edge see you after this Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever, I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press... Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Where are we going on this show? It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> what? Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, <laughs> I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done 
is actually making more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up in this hour, machete-wielding gang attacks, armed raids on pizza shops and a fugitive on the loose. We'll ask what's behind the crime epidemic sweeping Great Britain. And football is cancelled. A Met Office warning that climate change could spell the end of the grassroots game. Plus, the countryside is racist. That's according to 80 charities, including the RSPCA and the National Trust. Now, Britain was outraged when the Nottingham triple killer Valdo Calocane was allowed to plead guilty to a manslaughter charge last month, thus avoiding a lifetime jail sentence for the murder of 19-year-old students Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar, plus the school caretaker Ian Coates. The families of the victims were united in horror that the man who appeared to have meticulously planned his rampage was somehow allowed to get away with a lesser sentence because of, in quotes, diminished responsibility. They blamed the Crown Prosecution Service for downgrading the crimes so that they could secure the conviction. And it means that the paranoid schizophrenic will be detained under the Mental Health Act in a high-security hospital for life. But he may be released if he is no longer deemed to be a risk to the public. And you know how that goes. We've already seen a killer released back into the community this year who was detained in a hospital after kicking a prison guard to death. He'd only been in for two years. The families have launched a campaign to get Calicane re-sentenced and the Attorney General, Victoria Prentice, is considering whether there are grounds for an appeal or a judicial review. We can only hope she does the right thing. But the story goes from bad to worse because it was revealed last week that Calicane, because he is in a hospital, is actually entitled to state benefits while he's there. As incredible as that seems, he's not the only one. There are as many as 2,700 killers, sex offenders and other violent criminals currently receiving benefits for the same reason. They've been sent to hospitals instead of prison. It is, ladies and gentlemen, yet another betrayal of the honest, hard-working people of this country, the people who pay their taxes and expect the government to do a halfway decent job. It's nothing short of a disgrace. According to Home Office rules, these criminals can claim as much as £80 a week Apparently, the state benefits are made available to them to ensure that their dignity is maintained while they're in care. They get funds for items such as clothes, for books, for food and electronic equipment. I mean, is somebody having a laugh here? Why on earth do they need clothes? Why should they buy anything at all? They should get fed, watered and left to their own devices. Being dangerous criminals, they shouldn't be mixing with people anyway. And the worst thing about this whole situation is that no-one seems to have known it was happening. The Prime Minister's office have vowed to investigate and the Work and Pension Secretary is looking into the details, they say, of the rules around benefit entitlements. Well, thank goodness for that. Violent criminals should not get any help from the state. It seems pretty bloody obvious to me. These payments are running into the millions of pounds. I mean, whoever said crime doesn't pay?
Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. Uh, and what about this for a front page? Uh, Blue what is the headline? Apparently, and we're going to talk about football a bit later on in this hour, after the VAR farce, of course, uh, a balmy blue sin bin card. So they could be introducing, like, 10-minute cooling-off periods, the same as they have in rugby. And they're now going to give re uh, referees not only a yellow card and a red card, but a blue card as well. A 10-minute cooling-off period may be trialled next season, it says. Pundit Chris Sutton told the lawmakers at uh, the Football Association, well done for complimenting, for complicating the game even more. Because you can imagine what's going to happen. People will be sin bin for 10 minutes and then they'll forget to bring them back on uh, or they'll forget to spend enough time in there. They'll come on at the wrong time. Goals will be scored when the man's away. Goals will be scored when he comes back on. I mean, it'll be an absolute farce. But we will continue to bring you all of those stories from The Sun and elsewhere uh, a little bit later on when the panel returns right here on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. But let's talk now about what I like to call lawless Britain because it's not just lawless, it's now Wild West Britain, our great nation suffering from a slow burn collapse of law and order. And I suspect this may have something to do with the abject failure of our politicians to protect borders and our clergy being hoodwinked by sex offenders and criminals to win asylum. The nation's shoplifting epidemic accelerates to new heights. Take a look at this co-op in West Yorkshire where a trio of machete-wielding gangsters emptied the tills. And this coincides with revelations by the retailer of a 44% increase in theft, abuse and attacks on staff in 2023 alone. The co-op director of public affairs was on Talk TV earlier today and this is what he had to say about his store's experience. Fred, what you're seeing there is the result of eight, nine, ten years of effective decriminalisation of retail crime by the police. Um, the, the police in the first half of last year weren't attending in 70, 80% of incidents that, that we uh, reported. So I'm afraid what you're seeing is a very common experience of far too many co-op colleagues and retail workers. And that, I'm afraid, is the problem. The police are quite often getting in the neck for not doing their jobs properly, but what on earth has been done to this country so that we've got sort of teams of these horrible, ghastly, mostly very youthful young men uh, wearing balaclavas, covering their faces, going into shops with sometimes guns, sometimes knives, sometimes bats, and just doing and taking whatever the hell they like. Let's talk to former Metropolitan Police Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville. Mike, a very good evening to you. Um, I know we have these conversations on far too regular a basis, I'm afraid, but this is another brazen attack captured on TV uh, cameras and they don't even seem to care because they're all covered up, you can't be identified. Um, you know, I see no way to stop this short of actually putting, you know, armed guards on shops. Well, the trouble is, Mike, of course, is that uh, too many of these uh, thieves well know that uh, the police are going to attend, as we've heard, about 20% of these incidents. Even if they attend and, and get the CCTV, there's no national sort of database. The police have got no national database of images like they have a national database of uh, uh, fingerprints and DNA. And if you look at the clothes they wear, and there are some, some distinctive marks there. So they've got nothing to uh, fear for being identified. Let's say the small 1% who do get identified. Mm. We've got a Conservative government that's decided that uh, not uh, sending shoplifters to prison is a, is a bad thing, so they don't even uh, bother... You know, mm. there's no fear of, of jail. And, and what you have is just a, a broken society where, at every level, people can feel they can just get away with things. If you work hard and play by the rules, then you ultimately you're a fool because yeah. the people who are doing all this wicked uh, criminality are making a fortune and they're living the high life while the workers are, are treated like idiots. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems as though as well, um, shops won't be able to put up with this too much longer. You know, the bigger chains obviously have got uh, the ability to write some of it off. But, you know, if you're a small sort of local corner shop and people keep coming in nicking stuff, in the end, the shop will just close down. The street will become a sort of uh, a less safe place to go. You know, you'll get that sort of broken window syndrome. Suddenly there'll be no shops on the street and suddenly it'll be kind of mayhem everywhere. Absolutely. And, and, and what, these criminals, they just they feel entitled to steal now. Yeah. So when somebody tries to stop them, as you saw, they, they pull knives or guns uh, and, and the, the shopkeepers are, are assaulted. So what was a simple theft now becomes 
a robbery. And, and who wants to live in an environment where your local shop is uh, constantly under attack? And it is this, it's, it seems like society has uh, broken down, people can get away with what they want. And it, what it makes, it makes people feel unsafe. And it, there's nothing worse than that. Mm. People should be entitled to feel that they can be safe in their home. They can be safe in the in the, in the streets. And if they go to the shops, they're not seeing all this uh, criminality. And it has been, as the previous guest said, you know, over the last decade or so, the idea of people uh, stealing from shops has just become something that the police... Mm are not interested in. And then these people move on to burglary, they move on to drug dealing, whatever else, because they know they can get away with it. And until we start locking people up, that's the only thing that criminals fear. You'll have ministers on here telling us about community sentences and they're utter rubbish. Yeah. I've spoke to criminals, I know criminals. The only thing they fear is going to jail. Yes, exactly right. Well, all you have to do is look at the Abdul Azidi situation in London, where this guy, um, was out roaming around literally the streets of London for an entire evening from 7.30 at night when he committed his horrendous acts against a woman that he knew and two children uh, who may or may not be his. Um, wandered about sort of, you know, for about four or five hours. We now know that he walked past MI6's headquarters, you know. Um, and basically, nobody's seen him. It seems weird to me. The police didn't even put out a description of him the first night because obviously they saw that his name was Ab Abdul and they didn't want to cause some kind of panic. Yeah, I agree. You know, so one Wokery plays its part in this. They're frightened yeah. to death that everybody everybody knew who it would be and that, they don't like to confirm that. Right. The second thing is, is in 2015, I had the world's first conviction for pattern recognition. So where, where I looked at, like, like, like my tie, basically, a machine could pick that out. Right. And I found a guy from, for two burglars wearing the same T-shirt. Right. If you look at Adizi, he's wearing very distinctive uh, a T-shirt, he's wearing very distinctive footwear. Yeah. Yet when I said to the Met Police, look, I can help you. I, I, I'm not just going to criticise, I can help you. They said, oh, this pattern recognition is under review. Nine years ago, I, I had that conviction. Mm. The police are not moving quick enough. They're not using... The, the, London is covered in CCTV, and they're not using these uh, the images effectively, and they're refusing help. And mm. that's a really sad thing. That is a public. really sad thing, and you won't like this either that I'm going to show you, but have a look at this exclusive picture from the Daily Mail, and I don't know whether you've seen this. It shows two police officers in somebody's house watching Netflix and lifting dumbbells. They went to this woman's home. Uh, she was reported missing, and because they were other elsewhere uh, police officers looking for her, um, they were told to chill out at the house, and so they were there for almost four hours while she was missing in the woods. But sort of, you know, I don't know, sitting there and maybe making themselves a cup of tea. They're, they're watching Netflix, they're chilling out, you know, they're lifting barbells up and down. I mean, this is not the kind of thing that this woman, who, who was luckily found, expected to see on her own internal CCTV cameras. It just shows to me, like, it just shows a lack of discipline. Yeah. I've said this and I'll say it again, that... Uh, when I joined the police, half of the other officers with me had medals on their chest because they're either armed forces of some kind, some type or other, and so you had really disciplined individuals. They've got less and less of that uh, in the uh, in the police now, and it, the idea that you would just uh, do that, doss around in somebody's house, mm. misuse their uh, home equipment and dumbbells or whatever mm. else. Why, and why were two officers there? One officer could have stood on the door. I remember as a young PC standing outside a door, you know, with, with my big hat on, just, just doing my duty. I wouldn't yeah. have gone inside and abused somebody's home. And they're particularly stupid, of course, because everybody's got home CCTV and ring doorbells and Alexa and all this sort of thing. And the more the police uh, becomes less disciplined, the more diverse it becomes, mm. the more woeful the performance. It's yeah. just truly shocking. Let's get back to a situation where we've got... We pick people because of their content of their character, not because of some woke, woke nonsense. Let's have a disciplined police service that does its duty and solves, solves crime rather than messing around like this. Yeah. Well, this is the problem, isn't it, that you and I have spoken about many times, that most of the justice system in this country now is failing at almost every level. And once you get past the police level, you know, we found out today uh, that one of the reasons that Abdul Azidi is walking the streets is that he was granted asylum because the Home Office couldn't be bothered to send a lawyer to his deportation hearing. And so when he told the judge that he had converted to Christianity, he just rubber-stamped it and said, well, the Home Office haven't bothered to turn up, so away you go. Welcome to Britain. 
what it, I think what frustrates people is that they vote against this all the time and there's no one doing anything about it. So the, we know the Labour Party, they would like lots more asylum seekers, the Green Party, the Liberal Democrats. And you think there might be some uh, a right-wing party, the Conservatives, that would do something mm. about it. But, of course, they do nothing as well. So I just get this sense from my friends and colleagues that people just think, who do I vote for? Because nothing's working. The establishment seems to be against the vast majority of working people. So people can just enter the country illegally, nothing's done about it. Yeah. They can commit crime, nothing's done about it. They can do multiple things, nothing's done about it. Why have we got a situation where people can commit serious crimes, sexual crimes, and they're still here? They should be shipped out on day one. We shouldn't even put them in prison and spend money on these people. We have got enough villains of our own without importing them right. from the third world to do all these wicked crimes. Well, this is the thing. The left always say, oh, oh, you want to deport all the white people that do crimes or all the British people that do crimes? And I'm like, well, no, obviously, but there's no reason to import more people who are going to do bad things in the streets, in people's homes, in people's shops. You know, we don't know how many people we've imported uh, who have got criminal records because they turn up with nothing. So the idea that you're just going to let everybody in and go, well, they must all be good. Now, go uh, next stop, the Church of England, Lambeth Palace, you know, sign up for the Christianity religion and away you go. Well, I mean, one of the big problems here is well, you, you get a big... On the left, they'll always say about misogyny and all this sort of stuff, but then they import people from countries who who have no respect for women and girls at all. Yeah. And you see that, that... So the biggest threat here from these people who come in on these alleged asylum seekers are women and girls who, who face awful assaults just like we've seen. And it's just... So they're just bringing this upon the country, and it's just not good enough. And everywhere you look, so if, if it's the uh, the police chiefs, the magistrates, the judges, the lawyers who represent these people, they're all drawn from a very small class of people. And they'll talk about diversity, but they have no diversity of thought no. at all. There's no working-class lads like me uh, uh, when in making these decisions. They're all they're all speaking in an enclosed shop. They've got this North London uh, Islington viewpoint, and it needs to change. And the Conservative government have failed this country. They've had over a decade in power yeah. to get a grip of this, and they've just allowed it to go on. They really have. Mike, great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Mike Neville there reporting in on what is now not just broken Britain, not just lawless Britain, but kind of wild west Britain. Absolutely unbelievable. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham. Stay with me, though, because I'd like to cordially invite you to the roast of Rishi Sunak right after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword and a, sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? There we go on the show. <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it's... Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor. <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple, the downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, 
I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. The panel have rejoined me, so I'll be reintroducing them to you in a moment. But here's something uh, that I think you might quite enjoy. Rishi Sunak hasn't had a great week, has he? I mean, after all, uh, he got into terrible trouble for making a bet with Piers Morgan. Everybody said he should resign because he was making terrible, terrible fun of all of those poor unfortunates coming across the channel in dinghies. Uh, then he got into more trouble uh, for making fun, supposedly, uh, of the woman uh, who was the mother of a, a young teenager who was killed in Prime Minister's questions. Well, you would think that, actually, he might stay out of the limelight for a bit, but he hasn't, because here's Rishi Sunak in a new promotional video for the Tory party, which actually went out on his YouTube channel and then uh, was made into a party political broadcast. Have a look. Hi, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the economy and the plan that we're working towards. But before then, I wanted to take you back to the context that we found ourselves in. We all remember COVID and the enormous impact it had on all of us. And because of that, we did a lot of things to get the country through COVID, like supporting the NHS, vaccine programme, furlough. Those things cost around £400 billion with all the other support we provided. And just as we were recovering from COVID, we saw a war when Russia invaded Ukraine. That meant that everyone's energy bills went up a lot. Ofgem estimated that they would go up from around £1,300 to £4,500 unless the government did something about it, which it did. It provided about £100 billion of support to everyone with their energy bills. But all of these things meant that we... Could... Now, um, this goes on for about two and a half minutes, oh right? God, now, I don't think I've seen... I, was, I actually took a photograph of the three of you as you were watching it, <laughs> stunned. Literally, Tom's oh, got his God. mouth open. You look oh. as if you've just seen a ghost. Laura's got a hand over her face. I mean, it's so loot, so bad. Oh, you oh. just go, what on earth were you thinking? And of course, it became the laughing stock of, of the internet today um, because everyone said, well, it looks a bit like David Brent from The Office. 100%. Um, and it looks like something David Brent would do because he goes on <laughs> to actually turn over... You're going to make page. him like it if he yeah. it's like The Office. Uh, like, <laughs> he just turns over these pages, right? And he's got a whiteboard there oh. and he's trying to make out that he's got all these great ideas. He's drawing with a magic marker. And, of course, everybody made fun of it, including Wes Streeting, mm -hmm. because people said, whatever you, wanted, whatever you do, do not stand in front of a whiteboard, <laughs> because people will put stuff on it. West Streeting put on the NHS graph for of waiting course. lists so that you could see how bad that was. Oh, and then okay. somebody put the words, help me, on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was even funnier, right? One, another one, another wag said, I quit. Um, and then there was one final one, which I don't think we've got, but it was something like, you know, I shouldn't have made that trans joke in Parliament. You know... But you oh, just wonder weak. who on that's earth weak. is advising you. This is Internet 101. Do you remember like yeah. a few years ago, yeah. a good few years ago now, when David Cameron just posed for some reason like on a video conference in front of a screen? Yeah. So naturally the internet got a hold of it and then put, it started putting loads of pictures of a certain farmyard animal yes. on those particular of course. screens. <laughs> so this is, the, this is so obvious. And right. to engage in this, especially because Rishi Sunak already has that vibe of being like the boss who wants to yeah. be your friend, but right. of course you're never going to be friends. And it's like, hi guys. It's... Yeah. Excruciating. Don't eat a bacon sandwich no. when there's a camera around. I mean, Don't me... stand next to a whiteboard. There's right. a, there's a few, there's and a also few he's rules. dressed in a sort of David Brent style clothes as well. And he kind of <laughs> he's doing this thing where he's like he's coming across as a kind of sixth form head boy. You know what? And this is as, my as, school project. Not as, as confident as as. No. as that is, I find it refreshing that he's unapologetically cringy. Do you know what I mean? 
No. No. Find, no, well, sorry, <laughs> not really. I just, you no. know, the thing is, because it's I... It's the most controversial thing you said. I, you. I just, I think, for me, I, I would rather probably boil my eyes in bleach than do this, but he's, he's, he's going with it. Like... I, I just I couldn't do it. I couldn't have the like. But how can he no, think it's no, a good idea? And who's, no, I, and I who's admire telling the boldness. you? I admire it. <laughs> I ha, I, let's find something positive, Mike. You know he's got amazing. Who 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 are his advisors and how much I mean, are do they, they ten? how much do they want to damage him? The thing is, all of his videos, even the really polished ones, have this Blue Peter esque mm, feel, yeah. don't yeah. they? I'm going to tell you about Bitcoin. Like the one he did at Christmas. I'm going to pretend it's this really sparkly digital coin. Actually, it's going to enslave yeah. you all. Or or um, he did a COVID. One where he took he took a boat over to um, a Scottish island and went into a sweet shop. You know he does all these videos <laughs> that are so cringy, yeah. but that is the worst one ever. Well, my skin has just. I mean my that one is so actually itching. worse to me than the one he did of the Home Alone oh, parody oh, yeah. at oh, Christmas, God, which yeah. was really cringy. That was yeah, but at least it was polished. It was dreadful oh. polished. I think that there's some kind of mole in his advisory team mm. who's actually trying to destroy his reputation. There is no explanation for this because everything he does in terms of of his, um, you know, his, his little videos, yeah. his PR gets worse and worse. Yes. I wonder if it's the same mole that was uh, inflicting itself on um, Humza Useless, uh, who mm. this day was in Parliament in Scotland, and he referred to the Ipsos Mori Pole as the Ipsos Pori Mole. Oh. <laughs> and, I mean, that was his latest blunder. We've got one more, I think, I'm told. What have we got now? Oh, uh, this is David Brent and uh, uh, Rishi Sunak <laughs> side by side. Um, <laughs> looking Can't tell them apart. Very much like each other. <laughs> It yeah. really is. That actually makes me like Rishi Sunak more because I'm a huge Office fan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but you wouldn't want That's to be friends eerie. with David Brent. I wouldn't want David wouldn't Brent want to be Prime Minister. Country, yeah. No, no not, not Prime Minister. No. No. Funny enough. It's not his strong suit, Rishi Sunak, is he being a kind of front man? I get no, I guess he, they he were trying but you know they what? were the trying to present. Is, that I, I have more faith in that in this unapologetically nerdy kind of thing that he's got going on than I do in Keir Starmer. Because I actually just find Keir Starmer so disingenuous yes. that everything he does is extremely yeah. off putting. He reminds me of my accountant that I don't like because he makes me pay my taxes, but yeah. I trust him right. because he's keeping me out of prison. Well, you shouldn't trust him. I don't trust you Starmer, should, though. You I don't should, trust him. I don't should this trust Sunak. Sorry, he just talked about that COVID package like it was a good thing. And, and he's and not... And it wasn't our he's, money. He's a clever man. Yeah. He knows that's why we've had the high inflation we've had yeah. since then. He knew After exactly that, I, what he was I'm sorry doing. to say this, because I want you to... When you, we haven't got time to share the whole thing here, but when you get home, watch the whole thing, because on the second page, when he turns it, he draws a little graph of inflation, and he goes... Um, <laughs> Last year, this time last year or something, it was up here at 11%, and now it's down here at 4%. It should be much smaller down here. He's literally drawing his own bar chart. And you're going, stop, just stop it. Just yeah. stop. What are you doing? Neither him nor Starmer really have the common touch, do they? No. I mean, it's... Well, Starmer put out a tweet honest... today saying, I fixed the Labour Party, and now I'm going to fix the country. And I thought, is that a threat? <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> It's a bit he hasn't mafia, really mafia. fixed the Labour <laughs> Party. <laughs> the Labour Party <laughs> is in terrible trouble. They've got hordes of, of constituencies where the Muslim vote is going to screw them completely because they don't because he won't ask for a ceasefire yeah. and they're not going to vote Labour anymore. Something like 50 to 60 percent of, of many Muslims have now said they won't vote Labour until they change their perspective on it. Um, he's also got members of his own party in Parliament who want a ceasefire and who've, you know, resigned basically from resigned government. from yeah. his shadow cabinet. I mean, you know, it's a whole mess. Anyway, let's talk about the country, because not just the country, but the <coughs> side. Because mm. this is a good story. The latest chapter of the wokest saga, wildlife charities are now claiming that the beautiful pastures of our countryside are racist. Of course they are. Racist, white and colonial. Uh, can you imagine going to parties with these people? God help us. Now, they're all back. Uh, Spikes Online's uh, chief editor, Tom Slater, the author of Broadcaster, Laura Dodsworth, and Esther Cracker is here as well. Um, the countryside's racist, Esther. Don't go there. Whatever you do, uh, you, you know, might I find yourself getting the subject to target of abuse. This, these kinds of... This specific, specific story always comes up in the news cycle at least once a year. Yeah. But I find... Um, jokes aside, it does make me sad and it makes me question where we're going as a country because Britain is still a northern European country. I, I suspect I would know what people from northern Europe looks like, look like. Yeah. I would never go to Korea and be like, oh, my gosh, all these people, so Asian-looking. How dare they? Right. Or, like, Nigeria... How, oh, my gosh, Nigeria's full of black people. This is just unacceptable. Right. But for some reason... You you can do that here in the UK and have it published in national newspapers and people just bend over and think it's acceptable. Yeah. I find it very, very strange. Yeah. But also, if you were worried 
and you're really concerned about the fact that there's not enough ethnic minorities visiting the countryside. Mm. It's quite an obvious reason for that, is ethnic minorities tend to live in cities. Yeah. But at the same time, if you're really worried, you're worried they're being put off, is, would you want to go around claiming that it's the most racist, racist place you could right. ever go? You don't want to go near those horrible people. Right. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No. But the well, point how do they is know it's racist it. anyway? I mean, I have to say, this story didn't make me sad. It made me laugh my head off. It's the most <laughs> ludicrous, absurd load of codswallop yeah. you've ever heard, the idea that the countryside is racist. Yeah. I, I think there are some people that just, you know, they'd kind of run out of places to attack. Mm. You know, we've, we've done all the institutions, yeah. we've done schools, we've done the media. History. I know, let's do the countryside. Yeah. We, we need to introduce um, diversity targets in the countryside. What's going to happen? Are we not going to be allowed in a national park right. if it's already got too many white too people many in white it? Too many white people, yeah, And good the turnstile's idea. only going to be open to ethnic minorities. It's absolutely bonkers. But it's also incredibly racist yeah. to even say the countryside is racist right. because it implies that um, ethnic minority people are too timid mm. to go into an environment where there might be more white faces. Yeah. I, mean, I find it just it, really it, We need to hear from that guy at Radio 5 yeah. Live, don't we? The one who goes into Radio 5 Live every day and feels yeah. intimidated. Intimidated. He doesn't well, he see did, anybody like he him. He did comment on this story. Oh, did he? Yeah, he has. So what he, he, what he said is that um, a lot of social media trolls give the impression that the countryside is racist, which is just his impression of the trolls. He, right. he must think they're white people from the countryside. Of course. But he did also say that this mm. is one of the most tolerant countries on the planet and he's oh, never he? experienced racism in the countryside himself. Because, of course, who has? You know, well, I go into is... the countryside and I've never really seen any racism happening in the no. countryside. It, it, the thing is, these people paint ethnic minorities as simple-minded dolts, basically, because for some reason we have to have someone that looks exactly like us to accurately represent our views. Or if we're in an area, an environment where people don't look exactly like yeah. us, but they are walking on two legs and have two arms, but who and they're clearly like human that? beings, <laughs> so that's, like that's that? still intimidating to us. And I, I, I find it very strange because I, I think to myself, have you actually been to like non-white major, major, like white majority places? Right. Because Great, many metro African cities like are Burmese incredibly cities, cosmopolitan. I grew up around Indians and Turkish people and Le Lebanese. I'm like, have you actually travelled outside of this country? Because I don't think the reality you is going to match up to what don't actually need to travel outside of this country. I just said Bermondsey is one of those <laughs> well, places. Well, you yeah. could, you could try Deptford, just down the road from here. Not talk, <laughs> talking, <laughs> talking about London, <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is a grotesque double standard yeah. to play here. You know, Tower Hamlets is literally smothered yeah. in, in Palestine flags. You'll never see it's a Union so, Jack there, but you'll so see plenty of Palestinian con flags. Confetti of yeah. Palestinian Palestinian flags has been mm. dropped on Tower Hamlets. So how are the Jewish people in Tower Hamlets supposed to feel? Yeah. I, where oh, where I is the outrage yeah. about Jewish people not feeling welcome in parts of London? Yeah. That um, hostage posters get ripped down in right. or mm. are smothered in the Palestinian flags. I mean, that's actually a real issue mm. where people are oh, experiencing that, racism. Though. No, they can't talk about that. You have to talk about the countryside being racist. I used to be frightened of the countryside because I grew up in London. Uh, I went to Bath University, lived in Bath. Um, never had anything to do with the country, so I went to live in New York, you know, travelled around quite a lot, but eventually came back to Britain and was married at the time and we had young kids. We moved to Wiltshire. And I was horrified, because I'd literally never... Be, I'd never <laughs> lived anywhere like that, <laughs> you know. And I remember getting home was there for the first... too white for you? Well, it wasn't so much that. It was very dark, actually. Yeah. You, know, you know, there were no lights at all anywhere, you know, oh and, and you would hear these kind of sc screaming animals in the night. <laughs> I would, I would literally, I mean, we got... It with, sounds the, awful. The day, the, day, paradise. The, day, <laughs> the day we moved in, right? No, the day we moved into hooting. the house, right? Beautiful. We couldn't get... It had this ancient sort of, you know, it wasn't a posh arger. It was like a sort of ancient <laughs> anthracite fired up uh, uh, boiler thing, Not right? one of your South London arts, And I couldn't darling. just switch... No, I had to, couldn't light it. So we were frozen. Um, there was a problem with the electricity. We ordered pizza. It was freezing cold. We had to light a fire. Kids were, like, screaming, tiny, you know... And I thought, this is a nightmare, absolute nightmare. <laughs> and, I, and I went, tried to go to sleep, woke up in the morning, there was no noise, nothing yeah. at all. You know, I lived, I used to live on 36th Street, right by the Midtown I Tunnel like in Manhattan. I traumatised you. And I just didn't I fancy it at all. And it, I just hated it. I hated the country. I think the ethnic minority Brits who don't go to the countryside very much have got a good idea. Like, it's a terrifying place. Why should, yeah. I, yeah. Why why so should we hear goats and I thought, trying to sleep? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> want to hear sirens? Yeah. And I want to hear... You, you want to hear sirens, you want to hear people, you know, Drunk, talking. brawls, that You want to hear cars, I don't know, I'm kind of suspicious of very quiet... I don't know if it's me. I'm just suspicious of, like, areas that are too quiet and nothing's going on. I always like keep a cricket bat behind my door. And also, I need that was the other thing. Yeah. Like... This little village that we lived in, everybody knew everybody else's business. And I'm yeah. not keen on that at all, really. You know. Why? What and was like, your if... business? Was your business? Uh... Well, it wasn't particularly bad. It was just that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. You'd, you'd meet somebody in the pub and go, oh, yeah, I hear you had the brick, brick layers round. You build the wall, 
You go, sorry? Yeah. What do with you? Let me try. You know. <laughs> Oh, I saw you were talking to Adrian down the road the other day, and he's coming to do something. I'm going, what? It's a scary place, man. Yeah, so familiar. Well, the country is scary, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not racist, but it is scary. <laughs> OK, I, I'm here for the countryside. Don't worry, countryside oh dwellers, countryside alliance. I've got your back. The countryside is bliss, mm. absolute bliss. Yes. Everyone should go. Everybody, ethnic minorities, yeah. everybody, visit the country. Trouble is, you it's can't racist, get there by train lovely. because they're all on strike or the rain's stopping them. Let's talk about Scotland because uh, the Scottish Health Secretary mm. has finally quit. This is a guy uh, who was stitched up by his own children, or at least he tried to make out that he was. Oh. Um, went on holiday to somewhere like, was it Morocco? Morocco, yeah. yeah. It was Morocco. And he says uh, he got an £11,000 bill yeah. uh, for streaming. Uh, stuff on uh, on his iPad, which was a government iPad. He claimed that it was his children who had actually uh, been watching a football match. So, I mean, pretty disgraceful to throw your own kids under the bus, isn't it? Well, do you know what the irony of this story is? He says he lied about it because he was trying to shield his family. And you're like, Come this is on. the Baroness, Baroness Moan defence. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. But I was protecting my family. Seriously, I lied, but you, you for the most noble of reasons. You, you, I mean, it's a noble lie. You know, you let your children play with a government iPad, yeah. then you stupidly let them um, stream data. And then what he could have done once he realised, of course, is confess it to his office and, and pay the bill privately. That would have probably been the ideal way to but way to shield everybody rather than yes. lying. And he's so all... it's, su it's such a barefaced lie of an excuse. It's terrible. But I don't understand why it's taken him this long to resign because he eventually paid the money back mm -hmm. and said that he realised he shouldn't have done it. But now, I don't know why he's suddenly resigned now. It's one of those scandals, isn't it? Well, on the face of it, it's really embarrassing to pay it back. But it, it seems like the, this story has been rumbling on for weeks and weeks and months. And yeah. I think it, you get to a point where you're not only seen as someone who's done this ridiculous thing and lied about it, but also you become a bit of a joke. Right. I imagine that's probably part of it here as well. Yeah. Like you, you become a punchline, you kind of finish. Well, I mean, Penny Morden was very good in Parliament, I think, uh, today, where the SNP were questioning her integrity about something or other, and mm -hmm. she says, well, you know, the Tory party may have a few problems, but what we don't have is 48 different police investigations <laughs> going on <laughs> in the SNP and what they've been up to well, over the last uh, several pounds. years. I mean, absolutely incredible. His name's Michael Matheson. Um, he's one of only nine... MSPs who are the remaining members of the people who were elected in 1999. So the SNP is sort of falling apart before our very eyes, isn't it? Yeah, it's no. not surprising. Long may it continue as well. Nicola Sturgeon, by the way, just in case anyone was was wondering yesterday, was one of those who uh, had a go at Rishi Sunak mm. for the so-called trans joke, and everyone went, I think you should probably so stay, out, stay, of this stay one. out of that Nicola, one. Nicola, given that you tried to send a man no. to a woman's prison and that yeah. was what ruined your career. Outrageous. I mean, do they have no kind of sense well, you know, at but, all. But what's interesting, I, I mean, the Scots know that the SNP is a dumpster fire, but I still think they're going to retain more seats than is expected at the next election because it's just a bulwark against kind of English imperialism. And I don't think um, Keir Starmer is going to woo them in the way that he thinks no. he will. So I, I think they know the SNP is pointless, but it's just there to be like, at least you're not England. Right. So. Still with Scotland, you know they're talking about raising the UK pension age to 71. Which is great news for everybody, isn't it? Because we can all work a lot, lot longer. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the life expectancy in England is 80, but in Scotland, it's only 72. Mm. So I guess Pride that's one was. way of saving money because yeah. if one good year off and then yeah, yeah, one exactly. good year, then you pension, succumb to your heroin addiction. Gets to keep yeah. all the rest of the money. Yeah. I mean, it's it's actually really sad this health statistics and it, and it's a disgrace for the Scottish government that they haven't managed to improve life expectancy yeah. in I think their country. Right. It's 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 um, an indicator of poverty. Well, particularly when they start on about how I think one of the SNP people recently. I don't really think I obsess about them, but uh, one of the SNP MPs got up in Parliament in Scotland and said that not only are they doing the right thing in running Scotland, but they keep getting asked by other foreign leaders for advice mm -hmm. because they're doing such a great <sighs> job. And everyone's going, sorry? Uh, Who, are you just making it up now? Because yeah. nobody's asking Scotland how to run their country, are they? Maybe yeah. they're asking them how not to run their country. Yeah, that could be, that could be true. Just a subtle wording. Yeah. Any conceivable measure, the health statistics, the education statistics, right. you know, they've got free university but fewer working class kids Drug go death. to university. Yeah. It doesn't right. make any sense. Drug yeah, death. it is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. Finally, um, we have a lot of Scottish stories tonight. The Tartan Army. But you're not obsessed, Mike. No, not no. me. No. The Tartan Army are allowed to take bagpipes into the Euros. Yesterday we had a story about how the Britons were being warned if they go to Germany to watch the football to be very careful because German beer is stronger than I English beer. That. And oh, yummier. Very funny. I mean, seriously? And they also warned them... This was the Foreign Office, wasn't yeah. it? They also warned them, don't drink too much or you might not be let into the stadium. And you just think, do you think you're addressing yeah. seven-year-olds? Right. Yeah. Great. 
I'm sad that they have to say that. I'm surprised they're allowed to do that because Vuvuzelas were banned at the 2010 um, FIFA World Cup. So mm -hmm. how are they allowed to take that? Vuvuzelas, what, in the South African one? Yeah. Yeah, but they kept playing them, though. They, I mean, they just kept taking them in, didn't they? I'll never forget that noise. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean... I will but... never forget that noise. <laughs> <laughs> what earth is that? It's like a giant bee or something. <laughs> I don't think bagpipes should be allowed in anywhere, sorry. Nowhere. Well, I mean, it's I just was, depressing. It kind of kills the mood because it's like, whoa. For it's the sort of thing that in Scotland, yeah, great idea. If you Funeral. go to Scotland, you want bagpipes. You don't mind them playing them. It's like a dirge, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, like whiskey is the same for me. You drink whiskey in Scotland, like you drink rum in the Caribbean. You don't want bagpipes really outside. Is this why we never get to drink any whiskey on your at, from your actual desk? I, no, I think it's some kind of off-com rule. You're not allowed to drink <laughs> while you're in charge of a show. Or maybe, I don't know. Maybe I mean, they made a specific... Let's test the boundaries tonight. Yeah, right? exactly. We could test yeah. the boundaries tonight and we'll give it a go. Show, are we? Um, we could try, absolutely right. Now, we're going to have a look at some of the uh, big stories coming up uh, in the next section. But first, before we do that, let's have a look because we have got Plank of the Week. Um, and you're in it, I'm in funnily it enough. Week. So yeah. let's have a look. Here it is. They have banned a woman called Lindsay Smith. She's a woman, she's yeah. a lesbian, yeah. she's a champion of gay and lesbian rights. And they've banned her from matches for a couple of years and revoked her membership. Yes. Because it turns out that she was being spied on by a secret Stasi-esque unit of the Premier League. Yeah. What oh. happened was oh. she um, she committed the cardinal sin of saying on social media that trans women are men, i.e. she didn't believe that yeah. men can have penises. And she did this from her perspective as a woman and a lesbian. And a lesbian. She was Which is a belief that quite a lot of lesbians... Um, well, in, in, in I'm not a lesbian there? and I also think that women can't have penises. Right. Men Sorry, I didn't have penises. You know, God, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Hang on, I'm confused. That's what this movement does to you. By denying reality, you will get confused. You've double-outed me. I'm not a lesbian, I and I think women can't have penises. Yeah, that was a sort of throwaway I, I line. It looks worse when you watch it, doesn't it? Are you not a lesbian? I had no idea. I, I think I haven't seduced you well enough. <laughs> Let's talk backstage. Well, listen, you never know, do you, really? Uh, you can never answer those questions entirely honestly. Um, you're watching the one and only Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, we're going to take a look at all the hot stories from tomorrow's papers, and also more football, because apparently that could be the latest victim of climate change drivel. See you after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it. They don't sense it. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the streets or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. <laughs> A crossbow, a hatchet... Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat... Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? <laughs> there we go, on the show. <laughs> it's carry on, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it goes. 
I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The world of woke. Now, it's a funny old game. Those of you who are old enough to remember will recall watching football matches being played in all weathers. Sometimes there would be an orange ball, so you could see it on snow-covered pitches where only the lines had been uncovered by grizzled groundsmen in winter coats. Then there were the mud baths of the 1970s where you could barely make out where the ball was at all, never mind the numbers on the backs of the players. Every week on Match of the Day, there was barely a blade of grass to be seen. And that was a professional game. I remember going to the school playing fields in February and working out where the muddier patches were, usually in front of the goal, where you could never see the penalty spot. But somehow we got by. Well, times have now changed, because this week, the Met Office, the government's weather forecasters, took it upon themselves to start talking about football. Apparently, around one-third of grassroots football pitches are losing six weeks to two months of the year from flooding due to severe weather. Oh, really? They reckon it can be attributed to climate change. That means they've decided it's climate change and so they've attributed it to that. They've taken the trouble to enlist help from the United Nations Sports for Climate Action Initiative, which recommends how grassroots football can reduce its carbon footprint. That's a game that's played outside, right? They cite Forest Green Rovers, owned by our good friend Dale Vince, as the greenest football club in the world and a great example of what to do using green energy, capturing rainfall, and even serving vegan food. The thing is that Forest Green Rovers might be very good at being green, but they're not very good at football. They've currently bottom of the league in the lowest tier of English football, Skybet League Two, and they're more than likely to drop out of the league altogether. So they might be as enviro-friendly as you like, but they won't be a sustainable business. How tragic. Meanwhile, the Met Office has got some advice of its own if your football pitch is getting regularly waterlogged, and here it is. This is what they actually say regular maintenance of drainage systems and um, regular aeration of grass pitches. In other words, clear the bloody drains. It's easy, this climate science, isn't it? Here's what they say. A recent study reported that by 2050, a quarter of UK football grounds will be flooded. What does that even mean? And how can you report on something that hasn't happened? Just get out there and play. Don't worry about the world of woke. The world of I mean, woke. Just ridiculous, isn't it? I, I love that one because there's always talk about climate change, mm. you know, you'll never have a white Christmas again. The idea that climate change is going to be so severe that in 10, 20 years' time it's going to rain a lot in Britain. Right. And in 2050, really make a lot of sense. they know, I think it's they've reported it, that there's going to be a lot of flooding. Well, how can you report football something football. that hasn't happened? Well, it's just constant catastrophizing yeah. and modelling. And mm. of course, you know, we get to. Well, we're in a studio with no real windows. Sorry, viewers, these are not real windows with a red London what? scape. But, um, you know, we could look out the window, away. we could look out the window, <laughs> and you could see with the evidence of yeah. your own eyes that there is no current climate catastrophe. Right. So they have to kind of make it up, yeah. they forecast it. But, you know, I'm going to pull you up on something, Mike. Go on. Well, you know I love you. Yes. But at the beginning of the show, did you or did you not mention amber weather warnings? Yes. I right. did. Climate catastrophe. Well, we haven't we finished to... talking about yeah, that. Yeah, but yet. we don't need to colour code the weather, do we? Of course not. Only the BBC likes to do that. They've yeah, got it's the big a bit surprised at you. Um, Why? Well, because you, we don't want to play. Well, no, that I said amber of... weather warning with a tone of sarcasm, though. Oh, I see. You didn't pick it up. I didn't. Clearly. I didn't. Now, uh, let's look at the Daily Telegraph because they've got a great story on the front page. And we mentioned it earlier, we broke this news that Joe Biden <laughs> has actually used this excuse to get out of being charged with you know, giving away secrets. He basically says um, that he's an old man and he hasn't got a very good memory. So the Telegraph front page headline, <laughs> Biden can't remember when he was vice president. 
I'm surprised if you can remember where he is right now, really. I'm I mean, yeah, yeah, that's... it's not going well. I mean, Here he comes. Do you remember five minutes ago, it was a right-wing talking point and really mean to suggest that maybe he wasn't yeah. quite with it. But you can't ignore the evidence of your own eyes. It is no. just hilarious. It's elder this week, abuse is this what this week is he had that horrendous appearance in front of the press where he talked about the ceasefire offer that was coming from Hamas. Couldn't remember who Hamas were, couldn't remember the name. <laughs> somebody, from, somebody from the actual press shouted, Hamas! And he went, oh, yeah. He called they're, them they're the opposition. Along. He called them the opposition. <laughs> and then he referred to a meeting that he had at a G7 in London when he was president, so presumably last year, mm -hmm. um, with uh, Francois Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl, yeah, who both of whom in, are dead. Yeah, in the 1990s. Did, didn't Francois um, Mitterrand have both his wife and his mistress at his funeral? Ah. I think that was it, yeah. That was Mitterrand, yeah. Actually, yeah. let's have a look. I think we've got the Biden-Hamas clip, if you haven't seen it. Check this. There is some movement... And I don't want to, I don't want to, well, maybe choose my words. There's some movement, there's been a response from the, uh, the, the, there's been a response from the opposition, but, um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas. But it seems to be uh, a little over the top. We're not sure where it is. There's a continuing negotiation right now. What? Ladies which and gentlemen, the president, president of, of the, the free world. Yeah. Which, which makes your skin itch more? I mean, the Rishi Sunak video or the Biden video? Could be a lot worse. I think Biden. To be worse. honest, I, I, it's, it's sad, sad, I'll, I'll take Sunak. I will take Sunak over all of them. 100%. Yeah. Mm. I would, yeah. Oh, my God. Um, how about this front page of The Times? Starmer angers the left with Labour's green reversal. So here he is once again, uh, sp splitting the party down the middle mm -hmm. because he's once again doing a U-turn. I said this earlier, on a day when he didn't have to do it. You know, Sunak was, you know, struggling, having to answer to the father uh, of, the, of the dead teenager mm -hmm. why, um, you know, he hadn't apologised. And instead of just not doing anything, Starmer announces this U-turn. Especially it was the day after he was being accused of U-turning all the time. Yeah. I know that got crowded out by all of the faux outrage over yeah. the Brianna Jai stuff. But yeah. It, is, it was always coming, wasn't it? Because Keir Starmer is, is the quintessential, if you don't like these principles, I've got some more sort of yeah. politician. I mean, you thought he tried to present the green stuff as something that he actually cared about. Like, it was the one thing. I've been a pescatarian yeah. most of my life and I really care about right. this. I really want to get all those windmills up. But the fact that even on this he was willing to fold, you just think... Aside from anything else, what is this party for? What, what is this manifesto going to look like? Is it just going to be a series of nice photos of Keir Starmer yeah. walking out and about in the racist countryside? What is it, what is it going to be? Because mm. they, they, any policy that... Say what you will about this policy, at least it was an offer, at least it was something you could put on a headline. Mm. Uh, it's but just not... going to be with a more competent version of the Tories and yeah. a bit nicer. Is right. that all they're going to be? Well, you know, like? he may be angering the left with his U-turn, but he'll be pleasing nearly all Labour voters and most of the country. Yes, I think, I mean, that is the problem, isn't it? The, well, it, it, well, so really, is, really, this huge time will be a success for It's Labour. not really that risky because the people that would say, oh, I'm not going to vote for him, are actually still going to vote No, but the him. problem for him, he's, though, he's is that he's got, to get, he's got to convince these people who don't agree with him to stand on that as a manifesto. Yeah. And that's, the, that's the, where it starts to get tricky because people might say, oh, yeah, but great, the Labour Party have reversed this and so they're not going to spend all this money. But they're going to be listening to, to MPs or pers prospective MPs who are going to be lying about it. I think part of the problem, though... Is I think, anyway. We act as if the Labour Party is so much further out on green stuff than the Tory party. They're really not. This really is the narcissism of small differences to a certain right. extent. Both of them are committed to net zero. You won't really have a choice at the next election in many constituencies between parties. They're all signed up to the well, yeah. Yeah, it's a project of, yeah. of national uh, economic suicide. Um, and so, yes, this policy is unravelled, it's embarrassing for him and so on, but it's like really, unfortunately, for a long time now, all of the main political parties have been attached to this... Religion. Yeah. yeah no, well, every country in the Western world mm -hmm. has been it's, attached it's, to it. It's suicidal. And right. at, at some point, they need to go, they're going to need to wake up. I've always asked, what happens on, on January the 1st, 2050? Does confetti fall from the heavens because we've finally done it? I, well, I Al don't Gore, understand it. You're like this. Al Gore was interviewed uh, at the World Economic Forum, funnily enough. Um, and he was asked what will happen when we reach net zero, mm. like, as if we ever will, because mm. nobody can even define what that is. And he actually says, well, the Earth's temperature will stop rising. Mm. And you go, OK, is then, is Al. Is that right? Right. <laughs> this is a man who produced a movie that was so full of inaccuracies that a judge wouldn't allow it to be shown to schoolchildren. It was called An Inconvenient Truth, <laughs> and it was full of lies. <laughs> <laughs> 
and that might be schools wanted to show it to kids, and a couple of schools and a couple of parents went to the to judge and said, I don't want my kids seeing this. It's propaganda. It's rubbish. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the judge went, yeah, it's rubbish. So, sorry, Al. And this is a man who I think spends £30,000 a year uh, just for the electricity for the lights in his house. There's a really nasty return to feudalism feel about all of this. Yeah. Because, of course, we know that the elites won't be making any great sacrifices whatsoever. Of course not. It's all about kind of creating a new surf class. You, yeah. know? you don't get to leave your city because no. you're not going to have a car anymore. Um, you're not going to be able to heat your home because you won't be allowed to have a boiler. No. It makes life sound utterly miserable. It's not really... Oh, well, here's the direct comparison. So Sadiq Khan, such a, a net zero fan, yes. you know he's the chair of the C40 yeah, yeah. Cities group. So their ambitious target for 2030 that is in, in London and all these other cities, people will eat no meat, no dairy, buy three items of clothing a year. Yes, three, like three pairs of socks a year yeah. or something, and have no cars and only one short haul return flight every three years. Yeah. That's our oh, mayor of London. That's Sadiq. what he wants for I'd Londoners Sadiq by 2030. On flight and no return ticket. Thanks very much, <laughs> Cheerio. See you later. A very weird story in front of the Metro I want to talk about. Um, absurd arena bomb denier. I've never seen this story before. A bloke called Richard Hall who's being sued by a father and daughter who were injured in the 2017 Manchester Arena bombing attack. He's a conspiracy theorist and he was trying to peddle a claim that the whole bombing was faked. And that's been thrown out by a judge. I don't know why it's come to court particularly. I, seriously, um, I'm sure the judge couldn't believe. But his it's, or a sort her of, eyes. it's a sort of cut rate Alex Jones type figure, mm. yeah. you know, who seems to be known as a disaster troll who goes around filming victims at their workplaces and homes and arguing that they were actors. Very weird, isn't it? Very I mean, this strange. Is, this is sort of the dark side of the internet. I mean, I feel sorry for the judge. What yeah. a complete waste of time. I know. Absolutely <laughs> horrific. Yeah. Now, we've got here on the front of the Telegraph, now we've got Sinn Féin calling Hamas partners in peace. That's nice, isn't it? This is uh, why that's what you perhaps not the greatest called. idea to put Sinn Féin in charge of Northern Ireland. The new Sinn Féin first minister, <coughs> in an interview with Andrew Marr, um, basically that the, in dialogue is important in ending conflict. She called for a ceasefire in the, Islam, uh, sorry, the Israeli Hamas war, declared Gaza a graveyard for children. I, the pro-Palestine set, whether it's Sinn Féin or anyone else, I do wonder why they can't even make this tiny concession, which is say, we're on the side of the Palestinians, yeah. we want a two-state solution, all that stuff, but Hamas are scumbags, they're fascists, and they yeah. want to go. It, would it really be why that Why would hard? Hamas be the hill you want to die on? Yeah. That's, what, that's, what, that's what I they don't do understand. They do it time and time. I, I know. Know. But the thing like, is, I said this, I don't know... I, mean, they... I, I, under I understand there are factions within sort of the pro-Palestinian movement that mm -hmm. are ge generally just hateful, but I, I don't understand why... We're seeing what's going on, and these people generally believe that to act in the interest of, of people dying in this yeah. conflict is to go and s shout hateful stuff or yeah. just align themselves with just mm -hmm. really unpalatable mm. like sides of this conflict. I'm like, how how could you possibly be helping the people that you claim to be helping? Because they're not really pro Hamas. They're anti Israel. Or pro Palestine. Really. They're anti Israel. They're, they're yeah. anti Israel. But you have because to remember... otherwise, they would support all the other terrorist yeah. organizations. Well, also, you have to world. remember the Sinn Fein organization yeah. was born out of the IRA. The IRA was a terrorist organisation, whichever way you look at it, I'm afraid. Yeah, I one mean, final really, one, we haven't really got time to discuss it, but church accused of operating conveyor belt of asylum seeker baptisms. It just conjures up an interesting picture for me of sort of a load of people outside <laughs> Westminster, Westminster like Abbey. Like a long queue. Like, yeah, yeah. Just a big long yeah. queue going around. You know, I mean, I'm got, sure that queue uh, is a bit of stock Anyway, right there now. we are. Uh, that pretty much sums up the show, I think, doesn't it? Thank you very much indeed to all of you. Uh, that's all from me. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, thanks to all of the guests. I'll see you tomorrow night at 7pm. Plank of the Week with Laura, only on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it.
this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. A crossbow, a hatchet. Multiple a... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a horse crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Where are we going on this show? It's carry on what just happened. Whoa! <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spending.